where will you find resilience? Redeploy. Hello, everyone. Um, thanks for the introduction. Uh, I just want to let you know that I'm, I'm very excited to, to be speaking here. And this is, uh, I've learned so much for the first uh, yesterday and this morning. And uh, it's funny because I did some changes to my slides last night. Not like a drastic change, but kind of some uh, changes there. Um, so this talk is very different than I think what uh, you, uh, what I've heard at least from yesterday and today, um, and this is very a practical approach. So you'll, you'll see that. It's going to be a lot of things like, well, yeah, duh, don't do that, or, you know, hey, this is kind of some older pieces, but really my thought in this talk was to kind of walk you through uh, a resiliency journey with uh, my company, Elasticsearch, not my company, but a company I worked for, Elasticsearch. So you can kind of see from a distributed system perspective how our developers worked uh, with the product and understanding how it breaks and how it's broken for other uh, customers and users and what are the things that we've done within inside the application specifically. And again, if none of this really applies to you, that's, that's fine because there's going to be zombie pictures, which is pretty cool. And uh, maybe there's something that you can, you know, the challenge here, I guess, uh, is, is there something that you can maybe take away from uh, a, specific, a specific thing that you can do within your distributed system or your process and so forth that maybe can be applied here? So, uh, if not, like I said, zombie pictures, so that's not bad. So again, my name is George Kobar. I am not George Potter, so I've been using my brain to think about all these different things. Um, but you know, I'm a, a community advocate, and again, one of the things that I like talking about is is how people are using our software and how to, uh, you know, telling the stories of our developers. And that's kind of the role I'm playing today. And, and one thing that I want to, to talk to you about, um, so we have a common uh, framework, is what Elasticsearch is, uh, or the company Elastic, and a little bit of the architecture, so we have a common framework uh, that we can kind of, uh, our common language we can speak to. But Elasticsearch is a distributed search and analytics engine. And actually, just for a show of hands, uh, who, uh, who knows about Elastic or Elasticsearch? Okay, so I think there's a few people that don't, so that's really good. Um, but the majority, I think everyone raised their hands. Um, so it's a distributed search engine um, that sits on top of Lucene, and which Lucene is an information retrieval library that's written in Java. Um, and after 20 years, it's still being actively developed today, which is, is pretty impressive. And if you were to take a, an Uber ride, um, you know, from the airport, um, Elasticsearch provides that data to Uber. Um, it's a complex set of uh, data that sits on top of uh, maps, uh, different uh, uh, products such as UberX and so forth. Um, that gathers all that data to provide where riders are at and where uh, the, the consumer is at. And if you're looking at maybe dinner tonight, Yelp also uses Elasticsearch behind to provide uh, that data that provides you with uh, you know, does a business open at this particular time based off of Let's Five Miles, based off of Chinese food, based off of a lot of these different per, uh, parameters. And of course tonight, if you're looking for love, Elasticsearch also powers an algorithm that kind of brings people together. So looking for love in all the right or wrong places. So that's just kind of an example of how Elasticsearch in these particular ans uh, circumstances is, is being used. And just really from a high level, um, it's full text search, metrics, uh, application performance monitoring, log analytics, business analytics, uh, anything that you can think of uh, for search, that's uh, you know, typically what we're, we're involved in. So uh, I want to talk about that common language that, we, that, that I want to have uh, about how our distributed systems built, and then go through some of the, the, the challenges or the issues that we've seen, um, and how the development team an engineering team uh, came by and uh, resolved or helped uh, improve upon resiliency. So we have a concept of, uh, Elasticsearch has a concept of nodes. And these nodes are actually the physical location of where, the, where it stores data and which is where the Java process is, is located. So here, this could be a physical machine, a virtual machine, or a container, um, or in the cloud, right? Someone else's computer. And with multiple Elasticsearch nodes, they create a cluster. Um, after using a, a quorum algorithm, and we'll, we'll talk about this a little bit more. So the logical collection of data, this could be text or numerical data, is stored into JSON documents that's called an index. 
And the data inside Elasticsearch is distributed across the Elasticsearch nodes in a partitioning method known as shards. So as the data is being um, written into the physical location, you can see that, that the data is, is not evenly spread out, but it's, it's just uh, written to uh, particular nodes that are all kind of partitioned out. So uh, we also have uh, uh, the concept of replica shards. Right, so we, uh, excuse me, let me back up. So we have a primary shards, that's where the, the, the data resides. We also have a concept of a replication that's uh, distributed across the cluster. This is, also, this is called replica shards. And you can see here that the, the green is showing as the primary, like P0, P1, P2, but they also are replicated across to other nodes, uh, just for data resiliency. So um, one of the advantages here is not only do you have a copy of the data, but on read, Elasticsearch can choose either the primary or the replica shards. So the advantage of having the primary to be read off of and also have a replica, it also serves as, as another point where you can search the data off. So if a node happens to drop out of the cluster, um, or from a network outage or a failure, uh, the data is still available on this replica shard. So Elasticsearch also promote, can promote a uh, shard uh, to become now a primary, and then begins to replicate that data, oh, the wrong thing. Then begins to replicate that data over onto another, sh uh, another node. Any second now. Uh, there we go. So, so anyway, yeah, yay! So anyway, so now that this is keeping in the rules of making sure that the replica shard, or the, that there, there's data resiliency across the distributed system. So data replication happens at the per, uh, per shard level, and it's independent and highly concurrent. So as an example, we have a primary zero and a replica zero. And so on, we have a, 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 a you know, primary one, replica one, and so forth. So writes will always go to the primary first and then follow by the data replicated to the shard. So as data is written down on the P0, then it's replicated to R0, and so forth. So almost all the architecture, they hang with me. So at the cluster level, we have a cluster coordination metadata replication layer at the handful. Um, so the metadata determines which of the indices are a part of the cluster, uh, also the schema, which is very similar to uh, the mapping or within a relation database. Uh, but the metadata also shows which nodes are holding the primary and the replica shards, and that's also where, uh, if, when the shards are in sync or out of sync. So all of this data um, is captured into an object that we like to call a cluster state. And this object is... Uh, shared and available across all the nodes within the cluster. So this is, a uh, this is very important to each node that is aware of where the data resides and the coordinating of new search requests that come in. Okay, is everyone still alive? Okay. So very beginning in our Elasticsearch journey, um, back in 1.0, and this is approximately about 2014, uh, very few clusters, um, or clusters had very few nodes. So when we looked at, um, uh, issues uh, or recovering from failures, it was relatively easy. I'm kind of using my air quotes here. However, if we had a, a node that had a power failure, one of the big things that we had to think about was um, because this was a, you know, we're writing data into Elasticsearch, um, and all this needs to fill up into, uh, into a memory buffer, and then of course commit it to disk. But how do we capture that data if it's missing uh, or if it powers off and it's before it's committed to disk? Well, one of the things that we started to, to look at early is how do we kind of build that resiliency into that, that particular situation? So one of the answers that we had was what's called a transaction log. So each shard has a transaction log, and it's known as a translog, very uh, complicated. Uh, but it's, it, when any time anything's been uh, updated or uh, deleted or written to, it's automatically written into what's called, uh, yeah, this transaction log right here. In the event of a crash, those transactions, even before it's committed to disk, is uh, written right over to the uh, replica shard. And so this data, let me go back here. <coughs> so this data, obviously, uh, we're catching as much data as we can before it's actually uh, committed to disk. And we commit to disk, that it's a typically a, a pretty costly operation. Um, so we want to make sure we capture all that data before it is. And then one of the reasons why it's a costly operation is sometimes we want to fill up the memory buffer before actually commit to disk and then we can, we can kind of proceed forward. Uh, one analogy to think about is 
is if you have a sinking boat and you have one of those small little cups, it's a lot easier to have a larger bucket to dump all that, that water out of your boat than a small little cup to dump out. Throughout. So that's why um, it's, you know, we allow the, the data to be written onto a buffer, and that's why we have this transactional log so we can capture that. So part of the Elasticsearch journey resiliency rules is uh, having a trans log or write ahead log. So if you can think about some of these systems that you need to capture data into a long um, a memory buffer, it might be something that you might consider to have or write into a, a write ahead log or a transaction log. And the log for Elasticsearch is very simple. It's a, just a sequence ID and the action has <coughs> actually taken. And if this didn't really uh, help out, here's a zombie picture. So when technologies, uh, with technologies such as virtualization, containerization, or running multiple processes on a, on a physical host, it's very easy that an entire application could reside on one physical host. Um, for example, here we can see you know, on this Docker host on the very your left side um, that uh, you, know, you can have an entire application that happens to reside on there. Right? Whether it be uh, you know, um, if, your Docker can, you know, if your Docker host catches on fire or if you have a uh, lightning storm to your, uh, let's see, your hypervisor, ESXi host, or if you have Pennywise come and visit you, oh, uh, Pennywise come visit your uh, AWS farm, uh, or if you have a natural event. Uh, this obviously can, t can wipe out the entire application. In Elasticsearch, we saw this very frequently when um, you know, they started using containers to deploy the, the, app the application. They haven't resided on a lot of their physical uh, uh, container hosts, but not realizing that even with the shard copy and the rebalancing, that all of these nodes can happen to reside on one particular host. So obviously, Elasticsearch is not the only application that's susceptible to this. So even with shard replication to another node, it didn't guarantee that the nodes reside on physical uh, hosts or nodes. So one important thing that we advise a lot of our users on the open source community side is to be sure that you have some type of rules in place uh, where you can start uh, partitioning the data out or tell the nodes, hey, you cannot reside on the same host. So this gives us guidance uh, technologies in the software to have rules such as anti affinity rules or to specify when the nodes can or cannot um, be on the same physical host. So in this particular example, on the host that happens to go down, we have still replica data, or excuse me, we have that data on different nodes that's that also share the common data across different hosts. Um, so if we lose one, then we still have the copies of everything else. So there's a lot of ways that you can ensure um, that your distributed systems have on separate resources. And one of those things we have is, is known as, um, you know, for example, availability zones. So I know Amazon or even Google Cloud or any of the cloud providers uh, are very uh, keen about this to making sure that you deploy across uh, multiple zones or make, make, uh, multiple failure points. Right? or having uh, anti-affinity rules, specifying what node can't be with this node, or making sure maybe that these two uh, services can be joined together and they, they go uh, uh, very well together, so they should be on the same host. And of course, there's a lot of other platforms on here that can use uh, container automation, so true, uh, such as Kubernetes, um, to ensure that this is you know, possible as well. And by the way, every day, all day on, on Twitter, it's all about Kubernetes. Even Michael Bolton singing about Kubernetes, I just had to throw that in there. <laughs> so uh, the resiliency rules is use any anti-infinity rules or pods to nodes or different zones to be able to distribute your application across multiple failure points, which is kind of a dub, but you know, you still, uh, you know, you still have to you know, at least illustrate these things to some people that may not have the experience. So. And of course, if that didn't help, or excuse me, if that wasn't really uh, helpful here, there's another zombie picture. So something that was also discovered quite early within uh, using Elasticsearch uh, or within the uh, resiliency journey is that uh, humans can do stupid things. And I've revised the slide because I've been kind of convinced that not all humans are, are stupid. <laughs> or the fault is in the human, right? We'll get to that a little bit. But without uh, administrative guardrails in place, uh, a particular user that may be uneducated can send an unoptimized query which could search across data uh, spanning through the beginning of time. Um, and maybe using a, a query in such a way that can cause issues to Elasticsearch cluster. Specifically, maybe that can use all the, the, the JVM or all the CPU and would bring down the system. So Elasticsearch obviously, well, it's not obviously, but Elasticsearch is, is written in Java. And of course, if anyone has dealt with Java, you know this terrible out of space uh, memory error. Uh, 
Um, so hopefully no one has any night tremors from, from seeing this. Um, so one of the things that our developers decided to put into, uh, you know, so one, we needed a way to protect the, the nodes from health or unoptimized queries. So the development team decided to add a concept of circuit breakers. So these circuit breakers, if a query would result in a high memory uh, issues, it would exhaust the JVM, the task actually would be soft and it would be logged as a circuit breaker exception. So not only do we have the task of, hey, we're not going to allow this query to run, but we're going to actually stop this before it explodes this particular node. And in that, then we can also log that, so then we can actually go back and, and relearn, okay, you know, what, what about this particular query is causing such an issue? Is there something else that we can help, we can provide those guardrails for some of those uh, users that are using the system? So circuit breakers or rate limiting across microservices as well is also available. So an example, um, I haven't personally used this, but I know some folks um, that have, but resilience, resilience for J or Sentinel um, is great to help with those uh, circuit breaker or microservice architectures to make sure there's some type of rate limiting or, or, or circuit breaking across those systems. So resilient rule number three. Man, hold on, I'm going to put this down here. So the number three is, yeah, using circuit breakers or some type of rate limiting to know that your system uh, adds to a point that you want to make sure that you uh, take the corrective action or something that you can temporarily pause or stop and report on, on, on that is, is extremely helpful. At least it's very helpful uh, for on the Elasticsearch journey, the resiliency journey, not to have a single user bring down a whole uh, set of clusters. And here's another zombie pick. So if we kind of go in today, or we jump to today for the res uh, resiliency journey, Elastic, uh, we're using, uh, the use cases right now are for petabytes worth of data, and the use cases are very far more uh, demanding. So the amount of Elasticsearch nodes per cluster grew, and so did the resiliency and the consistency challenges. So the Elasticsearch clusters became so big, it was necessary for us to start dividing roles up on uh, what the nodes were responsible for doing. So the, the, the roles that were kind of devised, just to, for this particular talk, we'll, we'll focus on is what's called the master node and what's the data node. And it's to handle two types of data within Elasticsearch. So the two types of data have very different characteristics. So the data it nodes, is, that's the data that you actually search on. So that's the text and numerical data that's stored on the node itself. It uh, requires a high throughput. It requires a lot of writes and reads. It's very disk heavy. Um, and that, that, that data obviously changes, let's say if it's a time series data or, or logging metrics data, that data is going to be constantly changing. Um, and as more uh, events that you log, of course, that's going to be uh, very heavy on, on the system. Um, so and also you want to make sure you have redundant copies to make sure that you have uh, you know, the copy of the data if something happens for, uh, to the system. But the metadata, on the other hand, that was that purple box that we, we were talking about earlier in the uh, architecture. Uh, does not change as frequent, right? So the metadata is typically small, and the metadata needs to be known to all nodes. So it can, for example, route traffic to the right shards when it's doing searching. Because of these very two different uh, behavior patterns for these data, between the data and the metadata, uh, we have to use a, a system to manage these data types. <clears throat> the metadata is organized uh, using a quorum-based consensus. Uh, and this consensus algorithm is run particularly on the master nodes. So the data is stored um, using a primary backup replication algorithm, which is run on the data nodes. And these algorithms uh, are dependent on each other. The data replication layer is fully dependent, and it comes to indexing and searching, but it relies on the metadata system to take, make decisions about things, adding fields, and deciding which data can be called primary. So having all the nodes agree on a common view uh, of this metadata is important to provide uh, a perfect view of the cluster from the outside or from the client's perspective. So the client can connect to the cluster, but it's also crucial to ensure that the consistency of the metadata is within the cluster. So we have our client here, um, and we say to, to ask our, our cluster, how many ducks are, you know, what's the word duck within our, uh, within our documents? You know, can you provide how many, how many instances that appears within our system? And so, here. So to make matters worse, ensuring consistency of the metadata is not only important to the metadata itself, but also has a direct impact on the data layer. So the metadata layer determines which shards are allocated to which nodes, and which shards are primaries, and which ones are replicas. 
So there's inconsistencies in the metadata layer, which leads to two shards believing that the primary at the same time um, can have the two shard copies becoming inconsistent uh, between each other. And the data that are, are happen to be, are supposed to store the same data. So if we ask this of our cluster here, and it says, our master node says, hey, this data is actually existing over here, um, that happens to be a good consistent data, then we get the answer of five. But of course, <clears throat> imagine that one node has an inconsistent data versus another, but the data ensures that it's the same. This would mean the search node would result in a different result. So we have uh, the same example, but we're going to an inconsistent data, uh, or let's just believe the metadata says it's the same, but the actual data on the node is different. We're going to receive an answer of four. So it's very important that the metadata and the data layer that were that that coordinated well with each other are going to cause the data loss. So another common problem um, is one of the master nodes, and this is again one of the nodes that, that manages that metadata, uh, would drop off the cluster, um, or half the nodes become uh, network isolated. So uh, Penny Wise visited the data center and decided to take a note down. I don't know why it's Penny Wise, but whatever. Um, <laughs> So uh, obviously, this would uh, this division here between the network isolate. It's not uh, it's isolated from each other, but it's also still available outside of the system. So this would result in two distinct clusters, and thus two separate cluster states. So we have effectively this was one cluster, but now we have a cluster A and a cluster B. So this would result in two distinct clusters and the two, two different cluster states. And this would be a result of what we probably know as a split brain. So the metadata litter at this point would be inconsistent, ultimately leading to a loss of data. So many of these issues were known under the name split brain. When more one node cluster is acting as an active master and independently from each other, making changes to the cluster state. And hence the metadata, which resulted in inconsistencies. So one of the most pressing issues here is that, therefore, to fix the metadata layer, we have to prevent these split brain situations. And a lot of these situations came from that the data was not, in fact, wrong, but it was the metadata that was controlling that. So when we have data loss, it's not even actually the, the documents that are stored on the nodes. It was the metadata that was actually controlling this piece. So. Too much technical details, which is fun, but um, Elasticsearch first approached this issue with having um, humans kind of config, well, humans configuring the amount of master nodes that was needed for a minimum clusters to start. So the notion of a quorum, uh, which was used in a distributed system as the minimum set of votes that a change has to obtain in order to take effect. So in Elasticsearch, the minimum master nodes uh, setting determines the quorum size. It has to be correctly, uh, correctly configured for the cluster administrator in order to, to, to avoid split brain situations. So in this particular example, um, that what we call Zen, that's the, the piece that controls the behavior of de uh, deciding which uh, cluster state or how many master nodes can now uh, come up to the system and the, and the cluster now becomes alive. In this particular example, you know, we, we have three master nodes and it's a basic majority vote, right? So it's, it's taking the amount of master nodes divided by two plus one, which I think a lot of different applications, whether they distribute it or not, um, use that same type of quorum model. So just another quick example, we have four master nodes divided by two plus one gives us three. So um, without going to, uh, okay, so the, however, inexperienced administrators would still incorrectly configure these settings that we put into Elasticsearch. So it resulted in split brain in clusters, which led to, to data inconsistencies. And me, prior to being to this community advocate role, I was on the support team for about two years with Elasticsearch. And how many times that I would have uh, these calls with, with customers saying, hey, you know, I have these two weird clusters now, it used to be one, and one of the first things we investigated is this discovery Zen master. You know, what was this configured to? You know, in, in one particular case, you know, it would be one or the default of three. So here's another resiliency rule that I, I recently changed because of this talk. Before it was don't trust humans, but now I just kind of changed that into uh, pokeyoke the humans. So uh, who here has heard of the term of pokeyoke? Oh, great. So uh, this is the Japanese term for airproofing the human or airproofing the situation. So last night uh, during the, the dinner, um, I think it was Damon I was talking with, 
about this concept of Hokio, where uh, they try to eliminate, uh, eliminate as many errors or, or causing issues uh, that someone can have within their job. And what we see with Elasticsearch in particular, because we kept repeating or hitting the same issue of split brain, you know, we want to make sure that it was going to be as error proof as possible so you don't have the, these particular situations. And here is a zombie clip. So how do you fix, or how do you poke a open human in these, uh, this uh, quorum type of, of situation? And I think this part of the talk uh, fits nicely in with some of the, the other talks previous today and earlier, because I think a lot of people are talking uh, about the modeling and formulas and, and, and how do we represent these highly distributed, high complex systems. So I definitely want to touch on that uh, today. So increasingly large clusters and a possibility of million different node states, we have a way to resolve split brain or misconfiguration in which we call Zen 2. So I think about this slide, it probably could be replaced with Casey's slide earlier with the, uh, the, the network system that you have a million different states across, uh, you know, say thousands of nodes as part of your distributed cluster or distributed system. So consensus is uh, getting a set of nodes and a distributed system to agree on something. And that's very, that's very difficult and it's very surprising. Systems like Elasticsearch are uh, asynchronous. So if you can get a distributed system to agree on one thing that, that's you know, very difficult, then you can then have it agree on multiple things. And that was the first part, is to have it, have it, have it to agree on one thing. And asynchronous, there's no guarantee on how long the operations might take. So if you look at some of these, uh, this example here between the two nodes, um, we have messages in between the cluster states. It could take milliseconds, it could take minutes, it could be, take hours. You know, they could arrive at different times, they could be completely dropped. Um, they also might arrive in different orders that they were uh, originally sent. So just, despite all of this, we all want it not to go wrong. And what I mean by that is, we uh, need to have or design a system which you would have a consensus or uh, for the cluster to still proceed forward regardless if you have two nodes or one node that happens to, to drop out. So writing the problem down is the first step to, to understanding this. And writing is nature's way of letting you know how sloppy your thinking is. So if you think about this, if you think about designing a system, even from scratch, or even, hey, we have this complex problem right now. And how do we solve this? And a lot of people, I think, uh, go to writing, you know, uh, go into an architecture map or trying to figure out this system is connected to this system and, and how we do that. The problem with writing this down is that pictures are imprecise and there's a lot of ambiguity that can hide flaws within your system. So what's the solution? Uh, mathematics. So mathematics is a nature's way of letting you know how sloppy your writing is. Um, that was uh, by Leslie Lamport. So mathematics, and I'm not talking about algebra or calculus, but it's the language that was developed over a thousand years by people trying to describe things very precisely. And you think about, um, I think back to my, uh, my college days or even in high school, talking about physics, one of the great things about physics or even mathematics is it can really describe the problems around us. You know, one of my, my, uh, one of my stories, of my, one of my greatest moments of my physics uh, teacher is like, okay, what problem do we want to solve today? And one of the, uh, the kids opened, or raised his hand and said, how many mosquitoes, mosquitoes would it take to stop a freight train? And we spent the rest of the day talking about what things that we needed to do mathematically to figure out how many mosquitoes would it take to actually stop a freight train. And it's an astronomical number if you're really interested. But the math uh, software is instructions. So math can describe instructions. So in principle, we can use math to describe a piece of software. So in practice, there's a problem of scale. And the size of the systems that we build means that it could be handled uh, or can't be handled by traditional tools. So how does one go math math mathematically expre uh, expressing a distributed quorum problem? Not all mathematics can deal with branching or corner cases in principle can write a formula that describes this. But in practice, just having a formula to even work with on a distributed system would be way too big. I mean, con uh, I contemplated writing an equation that was like, you know, cover the screen, but I think this is, you know, sufficient enough. So this kind of enters in the formal methods or build tools to help us deal with models this big. Models that can handle millions of states um, in a way that we can use and comprehend it as humans. So who has heard of uh, TLA Plus or TLA Plus? 
Hey, awesome. And it's very good that some people don't know this, so I'm, I'm happy to talk about this. So a TLF class was created by Leslie Lamport, and it's a formal specification language that lets you describe the behavior of a system. So with the support tools, TLF Plus has helped specifically Elastic create models and properties of our distributed system to help discover bugs within the software, specific, specifically around areas of resiliency, and improving upon what we're trying to solve, which was at Zen 2, uh, or um, uh, Yoka, Yoka Poka the Human. So, um, so for, yeah, I like that one. Hey, okay, if that doesn't really help, there's these two guys, right? Sean and the Dead. So first we needed to define a set of properties for our formal model. So the first property is safety. And safety property says nothing bad happens. The distributed system never enters a bad state. For this consensus problem, it's all about agreement, right? So you have two nodes that agree upon a state and never uh, have a disagreement. And this problem with the safety property is that you can satisfy them if nothing happens. So that really doesn't do us much good. So we solve this with the other property. Um, that also says that something will good, something good will eventually happen, and this is just liveliness. And consensus really boils down to a quorum or a majority vote, which we kind of already talked about. You need three nodes to determine which node state is up or down, right? So node one, I lost communication with node two. Is it node two or is it me? Node three, I lost communication with node two. Is it node two or is it me? Node 1 says, I can communicate with node 3, it's node 2. He's the asshole, or she is, or whatever. The beauty of this is that it's robust and it doesn't need the rest of the nodes for this to work, and the system still moves forward. And this is what I just refer, uh, refer to as, as double tap, right? Just making sure that you have those two systems, in, uh, the, the, the principal three system of having two nodes be able to talk to each other and a third that's kind of sitting outside of that. So there are many different algorithms of consensus, uh, but the problem is how to implement them, which involves customization. Anytime that we deal with an algorithm, uh, anytime we deal with a quorum algorithm, we have to integrate that into our code. And this is where the, uh, where the risk for bugs come in, that we, have to, that we can get this wrong. So these potential risks or bugs can persist even if we do testing or code review. So this is why the formal, model, uh, formal models helps us resolve issues in Zen or the split-brain consensus uh, issues, to take the human out of the decision-making uh, decision process for the cluster state. So the two models that Elasticsearch used was model checking, which is a tool used uh, for model checker behavior, and it explores all the states the system goes through and verify that all states are good. And the other, uh, and the other one's the interactive theorem, uh, theorem providing. So this is just the arbitrary state and more specialized into the tools that we needed to figure out uh, you know, that's going to verify on our, our model checking. So in order for us to verify the properties of an algorithm, we need to give a formal definition of a, a precise mathematical definition of your quorum algorithm or Elasticsearch quorum algorithm. So TLA Plus allows you to use formal specification languages to provide such definitions. So TLA plus are written in a formal uh, language that combines the temporal logic with the set theory. So specifying uh, an algorithm or systems in TLA plus is usually done by specifying the initial state, then the next state. So it's a, essentially a state machine. So in TLA plus, the state is described and assigned values to the variables. So the one variables and the number of uh, variables for that no logical state. So there are very different possibilities of models. You should not concern yourself with the details here. So the most important part of this is then to define how the system transitions from one to the next. So here we have to think about the atomic steps that are uh, that's used in the algorithm should uh, look like. As with the model should be a distributed system, nodes should be able to change the state independent of each other. So if the request arrives on one node, then the processing of that request should be independent. So now that we have to deal with the concurrency, let's look at how the individual atomic, uh, atomic steps look like. It says that the node, that's here. It says that the node comes in as a published request, that it's going to determine the first slotted item. And then we're going to acknowledge that and send that to the next node, and then uh, proceed with a published uh, publish response. So then we effectively can see that 
we received the state from one node into another node, and then we've made that transaction. We've, we've actually acknowledged that. And then just on the, let's see here, right-hand side is just how we, we, we formulate that uh, with a mathematical equation um, with inside our uh, TLA plus tools. So in order to provide full specification, it's, it's not just sufficient to specify how these individual nodes behave when they receive a state. Right? So uh, it's also about how the environment behaves around that. So for the network, we consider delays, message loss, duplication, and reordering of the, of the messages between two nodes. But for the network, we consider delay, uh, excuse me, we also have uh, different model failures or node failures. So we're talking about uh, out of memory errors, hardware errors, uh, you know, Pennywise again, I got it. Um, so we have all those uh, model nodes that are, that are we, so we have a model for all these particular node failures. And one way of the key achievements of the consensus algorithm is that it works um, uh, correctly under the failure condition that you specified. So we consider the node crashes where it's persisted as a state loss. So finally, we also add another model for clients, which is submitting values to consensus algorithm. So this is a, 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 a system that has just started up and now receiving data, and this is the different uh, environment settings that we can set for it. Now, a lot of this, you're probably thinking, how am I going to use a set of, uh, of these tools like TLA Plus or formal modeling or even from uh, specifications? How can I apply this on my day-to-day -day basis? And I kind of ask that myself because I'm not um, an active developer on Elasticsearch itself. So I happen to find a great example. This is a blog, and you guys can obviously see it because it's dark blue on black, right? Um, but it's this, this idea of how to decide uh, how to uh, resolve the die hard drug problem. Has anyone seen die hard with a vengeance? Woo! Yeah? Woo! So basically there's a concept, there's a concept of John McClain, which was, uh, uh, he's a, a, a New York police officer working with Zeus, who was played by Samuel L. Jackson. He they needed to start, uh, stop a bomb from going off in a, a New York parking, or a New York, uh, a New York park. And they needed to have a way to solve a problem where they can exactly measure four gallons of water and put it on a scale to disable the bomb. Right? Very simple, everyday problems that you and I have to deal with. So they had a concept of, that was a joke. Um, you have a five gallon jug and you have a three gallon jug. And how are you going to take that problem, and how are you going to take some of that water and, and, uh, with those two elements and get a four gallon jug of water? And of course, uh, using TLA Plus, and the, the blog article is really good about explaining about how you set up the mathematical equation for this using these tools and the variables and the environment variables they put behind it. And here's the possible solutions for that. So Nicholas Camus had, had did a nice little blog article. So this, this kind of helps you introduce you into TLA Plus if you're thinking of, uh, seriously of using these mathematical tools to uh, solve some of these very hard distributed or very hard problems. And on the um, so to go on resiliency rule uh, number five is use math or really TLA plus for very complex or difficult problems. So this is just an idea and, and listening to everyone else talk about very complex uh, problems and issues within their systems and the complexity of systems, I almost wonder is it, is it something worth going through uh, an exercise on TLA plus for example to mathematically write the problem down and see exactly what you come back with. Uh, you know. In, the Leslie Lamport has, and I'll show you in just a second, a great uh, tutorial and uh, a web page that walks you through how using that. And after uh, you know one to two days of working with TLA Plus, you can have meaningful conversations about what this data, uh, how your system uh, resiliency is wise, looking for bugs, and helping you uh, with uh, coding your application. So two days is giving you some meaningful conversations about resiliency in your distributed system or across multiple systems. And of course, one of the things that I also wanted to mention is that everything that we kind of talked about within this presentation was all committed to open source. So Elasticsearch is an open source uh, uh, product. So it's something that uh, as you go through, and I'll, I'll put a couple links, if you want to have more information about how we, we came up with Zen 2, which was released in 7.0, which is fairly recently for some of the folks that don't know, on how we come together with creating a form of the, uh, Elasticsearch nodes. So where can you learn more about this? Uh, so again, Leslie Lampart was the, the creator for Alaska, excuse me, for uh, TLA Plus. 
He's got a great sense of uh, these videos and how you put them together. Uh, the other great thing is he's got very dry humor. So if you like that stuff, he's all about that. Um, but there's a great introductory course on how to do this. Uh, of course, Amazon has formal models on how they use Tila Plus for their uh, distributed architecture with inside the uh, EC2 instances. And of course, uh, specific formal models for uh, a core Elasticsearch algorithms. And this talk was also based off of uh, Yannick Welsh. And, and Yannick uh, works in Elasticsearch as a developer. And he, he talks more specifically on how he uses Tila Plus and goes through more of the details. And also, uh, there's also another talk uh, uh, from Elasticsearch Consensus from David Warner, Yannick Welsh, Boaz Lakes, and Jason Pugh. So, thank you.